system now being up there. Thank you for that introduction, Anders, and for letting me do the uh, introduction for the for Hova and Marken, and also lead the panel discussion later on. Let me first briefly introduce myself. I also work at the University of Stavanger. Uh, we I work as the uh, project coordinator for a research project called Future Energy Hub, which is a project that aims at creating more sustainable cities and buildings. So we do a lot of the same as the research network and us is uh, leading, but we have a more specific energy focus. Uh, for example, PhDs uh, doing uh, urban wind, uh, vertical axis wind turbines, also a PhD doing solar energy, and we have also researchers doing more energy system analysis and energy efficiency. So it's really great to have both the Smart City Research Network, which draws on so many disciplines, or we can focus a bit more on the energy side. So that should be enough talk from, well, from what I do, but now we're actually here to introduce the two speakers of today's event. Um, this is, uh, I'll just give a short bio of each of them. I try to shorten it down, so if I leave anything very important out, they will have to fill it in themselves afterwards. So the first speaker is Marken Wolf Wattner. She is a PhD student in the Division of Urban and Regional Studies at the School of Architecture and Built Environment at KTH Royal Institute of Technology and at the Norwegian Institute for Urban and Regional Research at Oslo Metropolitan University. She is writing her PhD thesis on the utopias and rationalities that are produced through smart city projects. So welcome to you, Mariken. Uh, the, the next one uh, that will be, they'll do the presentation together. The next one is Håvar Horsta, which is professor at the Department of Geography and director for the Center for Climate and Energy Transformation at the University of Bergen. His work address, addresses cities and urban sustainability as well as broader transformation to meet the climate challenge. So, um, and just to briefly introduce the talk they'll be giving, they'll be, they have been published in papers together and the thesis of today's speak will be on the topic of um, if smart cities as a sustainable strategy. Uh, because since the smart city emerged as an approach to urban development in the 1990s, it has become highly popular throughout the world. This first science talk will explore the concept of smart cities and take issue with the idea that smart city development is driven by techno-optimistic ideas and policy. In their presentation, Hova and Marken will be drawing on field work from three EU lighthouse projects, Stavanger, Nottingham and Stockholm. They examine how smart city initiatives have affected urban energy sustainability. So without more talk, I would like to introduce Marken and Hova to give their talk. You're welcome. Great. I think uh, our plan is that I will go first. Uh, Marikin, sorry to cut in line. Yes. But uh, this has been carefully uh, orchestrated from our side. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for giving us uh, the opportunity to, to talk. And I'm very uh, um, pleased to uh, and honored to talk at the sort of launch of this, this forum. Um, and congratulations on this launch. I think uh, from what I've heard so far, it looks very... Uh, uh, exciting and there's a lot of exciting stuff happening in, in Stavanger as we have uh, already discovered through our research and uh, and uh, this is just another uh, uh, example of that. I think I'm, I'm personally very uh, keen on uh, collaborations between uh, the academia and, and, and society and I think that can take many different forms um, but uh, what you're doing in Stavanger is, uh, is really excellent and I, I um, I, I, so I'm, I'm the director of the research center, Center for Climate and Energy Transformation, uh, where this kind of collaboration uh, or this kind of um, interlinkage between research and, and what's going on, on in society is, is, is core at what we're trying to do. So that's great. Thank you for the invitation. Now I'm going to share my screen and um, we'll 
uh, talk about some research that we've been doing into smart, smart cities. And our point of departure as social scientists, so we are, we're social scientists, we don't, we don't really invent things, but what we are trying to do is to try to understand the social processes of uh, different phenomena. And I think um, to, to us, to, to Marike and I, we've been interested in smart cities because um, it's been a very, very uh, important concept in urban studies in the past few years. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about it. There's been a lot of funding behind this concept. Uh, a lot of cities uh, have developed smart city strategies. So for us as social scientists, I would say even critical social scientists, uh, as we label ourselves often, it's important to try to figure out what does this actually mean? Um, not just what the concept means, but what does it mean for the world? What does it mean for the cities? What does it mean? Uh, is this concept and this way of thinking about cities and urban development actually doing something good? Is it helping uh, and, and what is it helping? So the question that we've been asking uh, in I think several publications uh, is, is this question, um, which is the title of, of, of our talk, are smart cities catalyzing sustainable uh, uh, transformation? And I'm going to talk, and, or we're both going to talk a little bit about why we frame the question uh, in this way of catalyzing transformation. Um, we'll, we'll get back to that a little bit. Hopefully that will become more clear. But the back background, I think, to this and what makes it uh, or our point of departure is that cities um, have really become um, important actors, important drivers for sustainability transformations. So I think for a long time, we have thought that uh, the world will be saved or not saved uh, through these international negotiations where, where, where the heads of state meet every year um, or every other year. To, uh, to negotiate the new, uh, new international climate agreements. And, um, uh, and with the Paris Agreement, uh, we have a huge step in the right direction for that. But I think many of us are seeing that the real action uh, is happening in cities. It's happening at the local level. Uh, and cities are now, uh, even with the Paris Agreement, far more ambitious and far more forward-leaning in terms of doing something about climate change and sustainability and many other uh, social challenges than national governments. And I, we can have various theories of why that, that's the case, but I think, uh, to me, I think uh, urban leaders and urban actors are, are where the, they are where the problems are at. They are sort of on the ground. Uh, they see how different challenges and different problems are interconnected. I think they're much more pragmatic and at times much more progressive and much more uh, forward leaning than many national leaders who it seems to me and just just again my opinion um, kind of stuck in more kind of ideological um, conflicts and, and deadlocks so a lot of interesting things happening on in, in in cities cities are very ambitious um, which is important because as this graph shows this is taken from uh, c40 uh, uh, c40 is an organization of the largest cities in the world um, uh, the action that cities can take makes a huge difference to whether or not the, wor the world meets uh, climate, climate targets. So um, cities are responsible for about 70% of all energy use. So what cities are doing makes a big difference. Um, though it's not that cities can actually uh, control all these emissions. A lot of these emissions come from uh, personal consumption, uh, national projects, uh, industry, and things that, that city authorities don't directly control. But, but um, what this estimate that is illustrated here tries to get at is that uh, if cities um, take the action that they can take unilaterally, and in addition, collaborate with other cities and collaborate across borders, collaborate with national governments, uh, they can achieve a lot. Another aspect of this um, that has come up uh, in social science, and I think it's really spilled over into the policymaking field, is that cities are really hubs of innovation. And I think that's part of why we see initiatives that we just heard about from Copenhagen and, and that you're developing uh, in, in Stavanger now. It's this very strong belief, which is 
to a large extent true. I think that that cities are really these sort of sort of hubs of innovation, um, and there are various theories for why that's the case. Um, I like the book uh, Triumph of the City by Edward Glaser. He's an economist, so a bit of a different perspective for me, but he really shows how um, cities enable smart people to come together, uh, and um, um, and and that's when you get both. You know, political debate, uh, political innovation, governance innovations, uh, but also economic innovations, technological innovations. So there's a lot of belief in cities and what cities can do. Um, and I think there's also still a large belief in what smart cities can do and what can happen with smart cities. Um, now, the smart city idea is also a bit controversial, especially in social science. And Marikin will get back to some of the smart city debates that have been going on and the criticism that social scientists have put forward against the smart city idea. Um, it's very often criticized for being too technologically optimistic, just to give you a headline, uh, that, um, that we have this assumption that uh, if we just invent these things, uh, they will uh, make us sustainable. Whereas we as social scientists know that cities are composed, not just of technologies, but also for, uh, to a large extent, people and social interaction, but also uh, existing material infrastructures. So the roads that we built 50 years ago are still with us. The roads that the buildings and the urban structures were built 100 years ago are, are still with us. But um, what can smart cities do? What can smart cities, um, how can smart cities move us forward? Um, and um, uh, th there are there's a lot of optimism. Um, one of the most optimistic ones I've seen is perhaps Google's uh, claim uh, for what they can achieve in Toronto with their um, very sort of highly publicized Keyside plan, uh, where they are, they are claiming that um, uh, by using smart solutions, uh, they're able to reduce uh, CO2 uh, emissions by 85%. So is that possible? Uh, and can smart cities achieve uh, this, these sorts of things? That, that's kind of what we're, what we're um, interested in and what we have been uh, researching for, for quite some time. And here I will um, give the word over to Marikian and then I think we'll try that I stop share. Yeah. And um, I will let you take over and we can go back. Uh, I can, I, I'm gonna say a few words at the end as well. That's great. I'll try to steal the screen here. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, nice to see you all digitally in a very smart city correct manner. Um, well, as uh, Hovart explained, the smart city has largely um, emerged as this kind of uh, perceived solutions to a lot of urban ills and a lot of urban problems. Um, so it's been a very popular pr approach globally. In Europe, one of the um, major funding uh, schemes for smart cities is through EU and their Horizon 2020 project. So they fund these kind of lighthouse uh, city networks where they have both smart lighthouse cities, then also uh, what was previously called follower cities, but are now, now called fellow cities, which is a, perhaps a nicer word. Um, so in these projects, the lighthouse cities are to uh, develop, and implement, and test smart solutions. And these should be then uh, replicable or scalable uh, to, so that they also can be useful for other cities. Uh, this funding scheme started in 2014 and has since that funded 17 of these smart networks. So it's a total of approximately 50 smart lighthouse cities and 70 uh, fellow cities that has been funded through these schemes. Um, so many of the smart solutions that are encouraged through the smart city are clearly kind of aimed at uh, sustainable development. And I'm sure you recognize many of these from Stavanger and from other cities you're from. So you have mobility as a service, um, efficient streetlights, um, yeah, and this kind of telecommunication that reduce the need for transport, for example. So, so there is a clear attempt link to um, between the smart city and sustainability strategies. As Solvay kind of previewed, there are um, some skepticism towards the smart city 
in academia, there are several approaches towards smart city. And you can say a lot of, a lot of researchers have kind of engaged more with the uh, straightforward implementations of smart cities to see the potential positive and negative outcomes of such kinds of, of kind of direct implementations. But then you have more uh, fundamentally um, critical scholars. So here, um, some of the things that are questioned are the sustainability impacts of the smart city. Does it really lead to more sustainable cities or does it just add more sensors? Um, there are a lot of questions whether the smart city is a very techno solutionist approach to urban development so that urban issues are kind of framed within a technological uh, frame and then they become technological issues that could be solved by applying new technology. But isn't there something more? Um, it has also been argued that the smart city is a kind of corporate takeover of urban planning and urban governance. Uh, and also it has been raised, uh, raised issues about uh, citizenship, um, uh, surveillance, etc. in the smart city. So the approach that we have taken to this is to kind of uh, explore um, whether smart cities can catalyze sustainable transformation and we have published uh, some papers in a book chapter on this, and we will present some of the findings from these here. Um, so the perspective that we take when we when we kind of delve into these issues is that, uh, first of all, the smart city is not one thing. You can say that we have these kinds of more global uh, narratives and storylines on what smart cities should be like. You have places where you meet other, like the Nordic, Nordic Edge Expo, where you meet other smart cities and you have kind of more overarching debates on what smart cities are and should be. And of course, also these international funding schemes, such as the EU through Horizon 2020, they kind of contribute to a global kind of expression of what the smart city is. But still, when you look at how, it, um, how smart, smart cities really are, it's largely determined locally. Um, so kind of the figuring out of the smart city occurs uh, to a large extent, large extent locally and is um, highly determined by the local wants and needs and what the city kind of aims at. That means that whether the smart city leans, leads to a sustainable transformation or not will be quite dependent on how it is shaped locally. Um, I just, yeah, but also, I mean, if you then kind of have a sustainability focus in a local approach, then the smart city will kind of help to push that ambition. It will be able to kind of leverage that a bit. So we have done field work in uh, three smart cities. What we did was that we chose the kind of first three, um, the first generation uh, smart lighthouse networks which was uh, Remo Urban. Remo Urban consists of uh, lighthouse cities Nottingham, Valladolid, and Tepebashi, I think you pronounce it. Uh, Grow Smarter, which is Stockholm, Cologne, and Barcelona. And then you have Triangulum, which is Stavanger, Eindhoven, and Manchester. So what we did was that we chose one city from each of these networks, and we um, went to visit Nottingham, Stockholm, and Stavanger. And I mean, we did field work in these cities when they were kind of approaching the end of their project periods. So I think the main part of our field work was done in 2018. So it's, it's starting to be a while. So I'm sure there has been some changes and some developments since we were there. Uh, so we hope, of course, that you can fill us in and let us, many of you probably know more about the status today. This is more, this was kind of directly linked to these uh, lighthouse projects. Uh, so we did observations and site visits and interviews with people involved with uh, the smart cities, some of which are in this uh, Zoom meeting, as I have seen. I think I've recognized two names. Um, which is then interesting. Um, what is interesting for this is that these three cities, of, co of course, responded to the same call from the EU. So the initiatives that they have are quite uh, similar. So they had to, or they applied they apply to this EU funding scheme that required them to develop solutions within energy, uh, ICT and mobility. So of course there are similarities in these three cities and many of them have um, 
many of the same focuses, but there are also some local vari local variations, which we have found interesting, which I will kind of broadly paint out for you now. Um, so uh, in Stockholm, the intervention areas are the Slaktus area, which you can see here from the picture, as well as Vallatorg and Årsta. Um, and in Stockholm, the smart city project was kind of used to maintain qualities that the city saw as, um, as desirable to maintain for also for the future. Stockholm is quite rapidly growing both in size and population. And um, there was a desire to kind of keep the city as uh, easy, livable, desirable place where kind of city life uh, would flow uh, in an easy matter, and you'd kind of know that you were in Stockholm because of its good life. Um, and so the smart city was used to promote this kind of quality of life and flow, and also with a strong emphasis on environmental sustainability. So you could say that the smart city uh, project kind of leaned toward uh, social and environmental sustainability in Stockholm. In Nottingham, this is one of the retrofitted houses that they that they did in Nottingham, which I think is interesting because they have quite strong tenant rights. So you could see that two of the tenants did not want to participate in the retrofitting, which is quite visible. I think perhaps they changed their mind later, but I'm not sure. Um, anyway, uh, in Nottingham, they have this quite strong history related to energy and transport solutions. And it was said that um, if various partners or companies want to test new solutions within uh, energy and transport, they frequently go to Nottingham to test these. So this was drawn upon in the Smart City project where they kind of um, uh, built upon that in their solutions. But also what was quite striking that was that the Smart City project was largely used to address more marginalized areas. So for example, in the this Snenton this district, which was the intervention site, um, um, the effort was put into the retrofitting of houses where um, people were uh, living in energy poverty. So it had a clear link to social sustainability in Nottingham, perhaps more than the other sites we visited. And now we get to Stavanger. Um, Stavanger had the implementation area of the Paradis Hillevog uh, area. And um, it was clear that when the Smart City project arrived in Stavanger, the oil price had faced a quite dramatic fall since 2014. And uh, it was quite widely acknowledged that Stavanger needed to kind of broaden their industrial base and have more than one, one leg to stand on. Uh, so the smart city was largely kind of characterized by that. And it was uh, to an extent expected to promote innovation and to absorb some of the expertise that had been let off from the petroleum industry um, and to promote these kinds of entrepreneurship uh, business opportunities. So it had um, perhaps a stronger link to economic sustainability than what we saw in the other cities. And you can see that also from many of the outcomes like Nordic Edge Expo, uh, like Nordic Edge Innovation Cluster. So many of these uh, activities that are directly linked to the smart city that uh, is highly promotive of innovation and um, and kind of economic sustainability. Then I think I will leave the floor to Hovart again. All right. So all right, so to, um, let's see, let me just get my, yeah. So to summarize a bit, then uh, obviously these three, we looked at these, these three projects that were funded at the same time uh, with the same funding scheme, European Union, just about the same amount of money. Um, and the European Union, of course, had the same objectives uh, for what these projects should be uh, or what, what the call was and what these projects should be should achieve. But what we found, so there are obviously similarities between them in the three cities. But what we found very interesting, and this is what, something we've been thinking about a lot, is when we go, when we talk to people in this diff, diff, three different projects, as Marikin has been talking about, they also, they're talked about in quite different ways. Um, 
And what we've tried here is to kind of uh, isolate. So what is it when we compare these three cities, what, how can we characterize them um, as in, in three different ways? If you want to um, sort of make a, a, a characterization of what, how is it talked about in Stavanger in comparison to Nottingham and Stockholm, et cetera. So then when we take that as point of departure, I would say, or we would say, that in Stavanger, this, the rationale the, behind the smart city project, the, the Triangulum project, is really uh, is quite focused on, on, I would say, regional innovation, competitiveness. Um, you know, uh, as uh, this this uh, um, phrase that we hear in Norwegian, uh, uh, more leg, uh, more legs to stand on in English, works better in Norwegian. It's kind of a, a phrase that we heard a lot. Uh, in, in, in Stavanger. It's about the, you know, of course, Stavanger makes a lot of uh, money from oil, but, but, but a lot of decision makers are also seeing that this oil age has a certain uh, expiry date. Uh, and there's disagreement on when that expiry date is, but, but there's definitely a look behind the horizon. So what are we going to do after the oil? And the smart city has really been, uh, and the Triangulum project has really fit into that discourse in Stavanger, I think. Um, compared to Nottingham, where uh, they were much more focused on, um, uh, I would say, from our field work on, uh, we can say social sustainability. Um, some of the projects were channeled into these, these um, uh, social housing projects uh, that, that Marikin showed. Uh, so it was less about regional you know, competitiveness and more about uh, social sustainability. Uh, Stockholm, in comparison to these other two, uh, the f sort of the, the 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 discussion was much more on uh, on the environment and environmental sustainability. I, I would say. So that's kind of the, the way that where we will end up when we compare these these three uh, these three uh, three projects. Um, but all in all, um, um, smart city is really about. Um, I would say what we call technological eco-modernization. So it's not like smart cities present a radical break from, from what's going on. Um, it's about making adjustments to the ongoing plans to make them a little bit more uh, sustainable. And that's what we uh, in, in academia and social science called, uh, called eco-modernization. Um, and there's one quote at the bottom of the screen right now uh, from one of the Stockholm um, city planners I think illustrates it so they had a project going where the emission was 50% reduction of, um, of uh, um, uh, energy consumption and then they got the smart city project uh, and then they increased their ambition to 70% so it allows in terms of how sustainable this is yes it's a little bit sustainable but it's it's incremental change based on existing plans technological eco-modernization so I want to summarize by, by some, some lessons, and hopefully this uh, is interesting for those of you who are not also social, and social scientists and academics. Um, this is what so the lessons that we try to put forward to uh, when we talk to sort of policymakers about this, what can we learn? I would say firstly, that smart cities are, and the interventions and what, what cities have been doing uh, within these projects, it's surprisingly low tech. As I talked about in the beginning, you get this idea from smart cities that it's all about sensors and virtuality and these you know, really high-tech internet connected things. But when you look at the actual projects, a lot of the things that have been going on and a lot of the things that have been funded in the smart city project are quite low-tech, like building renovations. Um, so so, that, so that, that's one thing. I mean, it's kind of to demystify the smart city a little bit. Um, it's not necessarily, that high tech, which is good, I think, it makes makes it uh, easier to deal with for for cities. Another lesson um, is it really I mean, how what happens with the smart city project from the EU really depends on uh, the local actors. It depends on what the visions and the plans of the city uh, are. It depends on what kind of people who is hired in the city to, to work on these projects. So is, it an, uh, is this project given to someone who works in the urban planning department? Is it given to someone who's working on social housing, for example? These things, like these coincidences maybe, uh, makes a huge difference for, how, difference for how they develop. And 
it makes a huge difference from from for what happens to these smart city projects. I would say in Stavanger, a lot has happened from Triangulum. Um, Stavanger has really done done a lot in sort of spinning out uh, off of this Horizon 2020 project uh, and creating, you know, hiring a, a smart city uh, coordinator, Gunnar Crawford, uh, and and creating a lot of you know, Nordic Edge. Uh, I think to a certain, correct me, but I think uh, to a certain extent has grown out of Triangulum. So it has really been sort of growing out of, of, of this uh, Horizon 2020 project. But that's because Stavanger did so, not because it's within sort of the EU's parameters. I think less has happened in many other cities. So it really depends on what the locals um, are doing uh, with it. But I think um, in terms of sustainability, what really matters is not, you know, whether you put sensors in place and whether you have this or that technological solution. What we see as uh, this may be kind of a social science optic, though, but what we see around these smart city projects and, and why they matter is that they create a network locally, they create an activity, they create you know, they, it's as basic as they, they, they have a logo, these projects, and people feel connected to them. People, people feel tied in. It creates a set of meetings. People start to talk together. Uh, and, and that's how things sort of, the ball starts to roll in a way and, and, and things uh, start to happen. I think we saw that in all the three cities uh, we looked at. So they can't just be evaluated by, did you invent this or did you implement that? It's really about, uh, these projects are really about sort of making things happen in, in a larger sense. And I think Stavanger is, is the best uh, best example of that. And then this is an advice that I've been given to Bergen because we've been asked to present uh, for the city council in Bergen uh, because Bergen is thinking about should we start a big, big uh, uh, smart city project um, and how should we do it? And I then for cities like that, my main advice would be it really has to build on local plans and ambitions that exist before the smart city uh, project. So you can't just say, oh, we're going to start something completely new now. We're going to be smart and that that's, we start somewhere else. You have to look at what, what, are the pre, what are the aims that a city has? What, what do you want to achieve in terms of sustainability, CO2 gas emission reduction, uh, social sustainability, et cetera, and then ask, how can a smart city project or how can a smart city EU funding, how can smart city initiative help us achieve those goals that we already have? And I think that's what, uh, what, what, what Stavanger has done well. And I think uh, uh, that's, that's what makes a difference um, for, um, for, um, for whether or not you could say a smart city project is, uh, is successful. All right. We're out of time, and I hope this was uh, useful. I, um, I, um, we're definitely open for question and questions, and I look forward to, uh, to discussing this uh, more with you. And again, as Marikin said, our field work is kind of dated, so, so uh, many things may have happened, and we're very interested in, in getting some sort of updates on what's been going on in these, uh, in these uh, cities. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you so much for that presentation, Hovo and Marikin. Uh, do we have with us uh, the two commentators, um, which is Anders Koberg and Anton Lanakev? Yes. Great. Yes. Fantastic. Because now we have approximately half an hour left. And uh, the idea now is to first have 20 minute, minutes of um, panel discussion between Hova, Marik, and, um, and Anders and Anton uh, before we open up for the last 10 minutes uh, with questions from the audience. But uh, if you see the chat uh, in your Zoom window, uh, feel free to ask questions there along the way. They might be relevant for the panel discussion, or we will bring them up at the end. So if you want to have a question yourself, just first type question, followed by whatever your question is, then we can go through them in order. Um, and thus, are you able to get the whole panel into a nice window? That would be great. 
Uh, yes, uh, um, well, I see. Okay. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for a great presentation. It was very interesting and, and that you have put a lot of time to looking at these cities. Uh, it's always good to have an external view on, on work we do. Um, well, I not really have any uh, eagle uh, bad <laughs> questions really because I, I agree with a lot of things of this um, uh, I would say mainly I agree that uh, a lot of things happen locally uh, is locally where you do things you need to change different things uh, and uh, well the second is combined with this is that I would say with City of Stockholm see smart city as a tool it's not the aim by themselves okay it's, it's always easy uh, nice to be pointed out the smartest city in the world and things like this but uh, it's, uh, it's just a tool uh, you need to have uh, goals for example sustainable uh, um, in environment uh, economic and so on and then you could use smart city technology and, and way to work to faster reach this goal and uh, in that case, I would say I agree with what you find and so on. To be a little bit um, uh, honestly, that uh, if you are a city, uh, your main uh, focus is to change the real world. Uh, uh, so you're not really, uh, it's not so interesting to be frankly, what scientists find. <laughs> really we need tools that you can implement work with uh, so our uh, challenge as a city is more like culture how to change the behavior if you organize your city in in silos for 100 years how to start cooperate across this and find new solutions uh, and in this case uh, and that that have case is very interesting to get this type of you you get an insight to see so uh, and i also would say we feeling that we're just in the starting of this journey we i don't really say that stockholm is a smart city we, we try to be we try to take step forward uh, and a good example i think that but it would be interesting to hear if you would give some advice for example stockholm uh, what should we do <laughs> based on what you have seen and, and read but yes mm. good uh, that's a very difficult question uh Marikin, so i'm sending it over to you <laughs> what should you do i mean i think um stockholm is already doing a lot of things uh in a good way i mean uh I mean, I think um, what and what you're uh, emphasizing as well that the smart city is not something. It's not like a stage you want to reach reach the smart city, but it's a tool towards kind of getting where you want to be. And I think that's what Stockholm is doing, right? In many ways, you have kind of identified certain areas within which you want to um, uh, to want you want to develop and certain kind of issues you want to. Uh, pro promote and develop and then you use the smart city as a tool to get there and to perhaps get there faster and to get longer than you would without being a part of the smart city so i mean that's not a great answer because it's just saying yeah you're already doing it but i think um i think it's hard to kind of come also from the outside and say this is what you should do with your smart city because i think it depends and i think you as the locals know know best what you kind of what kind of urban developments are favorable in your areas and and uh, yeah you're very kind but uh, but if you <laughs> it's, it's very uh, uh, good to have inspiration from other examples so if yeah. if you see uh, other cities you look at do they have something this is really good this maybe in in my case stockholm should look more deeply in or take its inspiration from and things like this yeah yeah mm. and i and i think um uh, if i can point out i mean there has been of course a case in stockholm i think in the valatorg area where some uh, residential houses were upgraded and it wasn't until quite a bit later in the process that it was realized that the average age of people living there were 
I think 65, and that they were perhaps not in the target group for very smart solutions. But I think that's also a problem that you see as kind of recurrent throughout the smart city, that it's, um, it's hard to kind of get real uh, citizen involvement and to have the citizens on board and to kind of hear what they actually want and they need because the EU project part like it has required to act really fast and it has required to focus on getting the conglomerate together but I think uh, taking the time to kind of uh, involve citizens more uh, would be helpful in Stockholm and in all the other cities that we have seen. Yeah, if I can add to that, I, I mean, I, it's also hard for me to, to be very uh, clear on what exactly thing that Stockholm should be is doing wrong or should be doing better. But, but there are some new approaches now that I think, um, I mean, firstly, I think to look at others and to learn from others is a very um, important thing. And, and we're seeing in these uh, city networks are developing now and, and you know, the cities are, are developing or, or exchanging ideas and things. Um, I think that's, that's very important. Um, and some of the new approaches that, that we see kind of come up in these networks uh, a lot are, for example, uh, carbon budgeting. So, so um, and we have collaborators in Uppsala, um, CMS Center there, and um, who, who are really focused on, on, on this. And I think that's, if you start from the climate, just to explain that very briefly, I mean, if you just, from, if you start from the, our climate targets uh, to say, well, we need to, um, uh, stay within 1.5 degree uh, warming. If you start from that, then the next step would be to create these kind of, okay, so then how, what does that mean in terms of how much CO2 we can admit, admit uh, and then make a budget for, for a city, for a region, for a country. And I think that a lot of cities are seeing that this is uh, becoming an interesting tool to see, are we, okay, we're doing these things um, and we're, partly succeeding with them and, you know, Stockholm, smartest city in the world, et cetera. But is it really taking us where we want to go? Uh, is, it, is it really making us carbon neutral by 2030? Uh, and and uh, to align the things that are happening and the good things that are, that are being done to, with these targets that we actually have to meet if we're going to meet our climate goals and say, okay, are they, okay they're good, but are they really taking us there? Uh, I think that's that's where um, a lot of the, the missing link in a lot of city action is is uh, at the moment. I think in Bergen, Bergen, my own home city, uh, where I'm right now, is doing a lot of things, and all the politicians from left to right are saying, "Oh, we're going to be carbon neutral by 2030." We're nowhere near being carbon neutral in 2030, even if we double what we do now. So, so that I think carbon budgeting is is a good uh, is a good tool to start to sort of think about what. What, what what do we need to do if if we're going to really be serious about these targets? Yeah, do we have Anton with us? By the way, Anton Manakev. It looks like you are muted. If I see you. Okay. Here. Yes. Now I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Welcome to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Erika. Yes, I'm, I'm, re I'm really glad to, 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 to attend this webinar and to see some external view as uh, uh, Marikin and uh, Howard actually presented about our projects. Uh, yes, uh, it was very interesting project and it uh, changed a lot if in Nottingham. There was a bit of, uh, how can I say, resistance at the beginning, but uh, at the end, actually, everything that we planned was done. And uh, uh, we have retrofitted uh, uh, so-called uh, uh, area with a bit of disadvantage for people living there. So the social aspects was done. We have retrofitted 460 houses and the average reduction of the energy consumption was around 45, 40, 45 percent. So it was uh, a lot and it improved actually uh, people's lives uh, to a large extent. Uh, probably I'll mention the the photo that uh, Marikin actually presented, because this is a very interesting uh, development. Uh, Remorban actually did uh, 10 houses, 10 pilot houses, and two missing houses, because the, the owners actually refused to do the implementation. And this actually presents the so-called uh, English proverb, my home is my castle, so nobody can do anything without my permission. <laughs> But anyway, this, is, this was very interesting development because it shows how 
district heating or heating can be decarbonized because what we have achieved in these 10 houses, we achieved more than 70% reduction. So the main idea was instead of going for very deep retrofit like a passive house, which is expensive, try to produce some energy on the spot and use it in the house. So we have used uh, uh, ground source heat pump, uh, uh, PV panels, uh, energy storage, thermal storage, 20 cubic meter thermal storage, etc., And we achieved uh, more than 70% reduction. And this actually brought a lot of interest in UK and the government funded another 500 houses with the same scheme with 24 million pounds. So a new development following the remote one actually starting now. And probably it could be widespread in, in UK because uh, in some places, some villages, there is no gas heating. So people are using oil for heating. And this could be a solution because what we did here, we have created energy center, which is two containers connected together. And we actually hitting uh, 10 houses later expanded to 39. And this can be repeated across, I can say in the city and in uh, urban and uh, rural areas. It could be a solution for achieving decarbonization because as uh, my, uh, Harvard, Harvard is saying, we were talking here about decarbonization by 2030s, but there is no chance actually we can achieve by the rate we're doing it. Uh, so the remote one actually tried to address retrofitting of existing houses. Why existing? Because the new houses that we are building are between one and 2% per year from the total number. So considering the 25, 30 years ahead, there will be not enough new houses to replace the existing ones. So the existing houses will stay with us. So we have to do something with the existing houses. And this could be the solution. We call this system a hybrid energy system because there is a connection between the electrical system and the heating system. And what we try to do is to reduce the running cost. So during the night when the electricity is cheap, we are heating the hot water in the thermal, thermal tanks to 45, 50 degrees. And this heat actually is used during the day. And because it's not enough for the whole day, we need to top up around lunchtime to add additional, additional heat using the electricity from the grid. But generally, uh, uh, if we actually can improve the thermal storage and the energy storage, we can actually achieve even 100% zero energy homes. Because during the summer, we have a lot of production of uh, energy from the PV panels. But unfortunately, we cannot save it, so we have to send it back to the grid. But this, as I mentioned, a very interesting solution following the remorban, and the government is funding it with 24 million pounds for 500 more houses using the same scheme. And this is one of the legacy of the remorban for us. Okay, thank you for that input, Anton. That's very interesting. Now we have a few more minutes of the panel discussions, and I have one question that I really want to ask to all of you. Some of you might have some good replies because I see that we have with us some students and uh, I guess all the students participating here is interested in smart cities and sustainability in general. And I remember myself as a student, it was very difficult to in a way navigate where I should put my interest, what should I, which subject should I take, where should I uh, put my focus, all that stuff. So. So I guess this question goes out to all of you, about Hova, uh, Marik, and Anders, and Anton. If you were a student today, do you have any tips for where you would focus your, your attention? Like, we, we only have two minutes left, so we need brief answers, uh, some tips to the students attending. You want to go first, Hova? I say you're unmuted. Sure. Implementation. So cities have very ambitious goals. People are really on board. Climate change is happening. We need to do something. That's basically agreed upon now by most people, except some world leaders, etc. But uh, so how do we get there? Like, what are the barriers to go from clearly formulated uh, ambitions to actual implementation and projects? That's where I think the, the key question is right now. Thank you for that answer. Uh, and Boss, I see you. Um, next yeah, yes. I, I could add on that it's this the implementation because I would say the, the, the greatest challenge is the culture. Um, how 
to change your mind because you are locked in silos. Uh, and even if you uh, are convinced by yourself that it should be another way to do it, a more smarter way to do it, you have your own budget, you have the decision maker, you have a lot of things like this. So if you can focus on culture change in organization and uh, networking in that case to be able to do that, and maybe what is practical solution, not uh, rocket science or uh, maybe Nobel Prize <laughs> science, more, more focus on hands-on. If I can add something, uh, sorry to, if I can add from our experience in Nottingham, probably energy storage will be the holy grail that can change things. For example, having electrical batteries that are cheaper, uh, because as I mentioned, Nottingham, if we have cheap batteries, probably we can go to zero energy houses if we can save the energy during the summer. But unfortunately, electrical batteries are still very expensive. So we have simulated if we double the existing electrical batteries, how much we can save. And in terms of the price of energy that we can save, it's nowhere near to, to repay for the installed electrical batteries. So this is something that probably can change things a lot. Cheap and powerful uh, energy, saving, energy saving equipment, batteries, thermal storage, maybe uh, felt with, uh, how can you say, phase change materials also used to be used. Uh, I agree with Harvard that we didn't have a lot of high tech technology in, in Nottingham and maybe in the other places because this was the purpose of the Lighthouse project to use existing technologies, not develop new technologies. So we have used existing technology, but in my opinion, energy saving equipment will be the key uh, element for the future. Okay, I will answer your question in a bit. I will first uh, just say that um, it's really nice seeing both Anton and Anders. I, it's been a while, so I'm not sure if you remembered, but I did talk to both of you <laughs> sometime back in the future, no, back in the past. <laughs> and I think it's, it's a very good case that you point to Anton about these houses because, uh, and what I forgot to mention earlier, that was uh, Nottingham City Homes said that if we didn't uh, do anything with these houses, they would have to be turned uh, tore down because they were in yeah. quite bad shape. So I think it's a good example of how the how the city via the, the Nottingham City Homes took these uh, houses that were in terrible shape and managed to do something really great with them and managed to um, yeah have a very good implementation. Also, I like what you say, Anush, about the learning how to work in a different way. When we talk, I don't know if you remember this, but you uh, explained also how. Uh, workers, I think those who normally just go out and do what they're told to do, they implement stuff, they would suddenly have to think, okay, but uh, they were they were kind of um, given work tasks in a different way. They were asked, well, what do you think? How do you, you have to kind of look at it when you get there and see how, so it requires a whole different mindset in every, in every chain of work, which I think is interesting. When it comes to what students today should research, I mean, I am. <laughs> Uh, still a student, even though at the PhD level, so I'm not giving away all my brilliant ideas. Um, what I do think, however, is that what we see in all of these three cities is that there has been kind of a lack of um, having citizens on board with these projects, which I mean, a lot of the people involved in these smart city projects explain how they have to convince the citizens that this is good for them. And I think that kind of also represents that citizens aren't really on board. And there are some uh, issues with um, the EU funding, kind of the overarching structures that makes it really hard to involve citizens. But I think studying uh, how you could kind of improve that and have citizen involvement also be something else that, well, uh, because often kind of real political and civic involvement is replaced by, well, th they are kind of providing data. so thereby they are participating, which I think isn't really uh, citizen participation. So I think also studies on how you could really work to include people better, better to have them kind of more on board in smart cities. Yeah. yeah I'll just add on that. I, I, our experience is that we start 
uh, wrong talking about smart city and all the listeners is, is was wondering and what is smart city what is bother me it's 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 much more better to talking about we want to have a better future we want to have a change things like this and what you then call a smart city or environment or what it's, it's, it's not the, the question it's it's uh, and that's i think it's it's a uh, a lesson for cities that if you want to have uh, the citizen pass it paper, you, you can't start with a technical size or or buzzword you you have in your mind. You you just need to talk about how to build this city better, and then you could have uh, pass it paper. Okay, thank you for your answers to that questions. Question. Uh, we have a few more minutes. I see that there are a few questions that has come in from the audience. One is from Carl. Uh, he asks Marikin, uh, you mentioned that there are other strategies cities can use to become more sustainable. What are these and what are the main pros critiques of these? Do you have any input to that question? <laughs> Just 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I don't recall actually uh, mentioning that, but of course there are there, there are a number of kind of strategies that are implemented to make cities more sustainable. Um, uh, and, you know, they're called a variety. You have like eco cities, ubiquitous cities. You have all these numbers of strategies. And I think the main point is perhaps not the strategy you use, but how you use it. Um, yep. Yeah, Hover. If I can add, I, I mean, when we teach students about urban sustainability, I typically draw up this continuum of, uh, on the one side, you have very, very technical solutions on these apps and virtual things and micro mobility and all these new kind of things. But then on the other hand, uh, and there's lots of things in between, you have this, I would say, traditional urban planning. And we've always tried to change cities and build cities in a good way. And, and traditional urban planning is really about where do you put stuff and where do you put stuff in relation to that other stuff so uh, you know locate um, residential areas uh, close to uh, public transportation uh, hubs and uh, don't uh, you know put a shopping mall way outside uh, everything else because then you just generate a bunch of traffic going there like this this kind of traditional but very very important um, principles of, of urban planning that that are not as sexy as as uh, as you know the smart city hype things but i would say you know but the basic thing cities need to think about in, in order to try to become become uh, become sustainable thank you for that answer and also do you think we have time for any more questions i see we have three minutes left or you do want do you want to round off the I can see there's one question from Midi that just came in, maybe yeah. was to yeah. Marikan. I can address that also quite uh, fast because he's asking about uh, the impediments to citizen participation that are more structural. And I think um, the problem when we talk to people that I, th I think also the, um, the people involved in these projects, they really want to involve citizens in a variety of ways. The problem was that um, when you apply for these kinds of projects, you kind of have to have an, everything lined up before you send it to the EU. And then when you have it approved, it's already settled. So you can't really have any citizen involvement. Um, and I think in Stockholm, one of the project leaders said that, well, we, we had the consortium together by February and then by May we, have, we had to kind of send it in. It didn't leave any room for for involvement so i think both the kind of time everything has to happen really fast when you apply for these kinds of funding schemes and uh, what had to be secured was the consortium and have all the private and academic partners in place so there wasn't really time to to focus on citizens so i think that's the more kind of structural impediments all right Felix, would you say some final words or should I just? Uh... I think it's okay. I would just say thank you to Hova, Mike and Andas and uh, yeah, and, uh, and Anton for, yeah, for giving the talk and uh, having a very interesting discussion afterwards. And I, yeah, yeah. I'll the word over to you, Andas. 
yeah, I also want to say thank you. It was really interesting to hear about these experiences from these EU projects. Um, uh, and just to mention COVAS, like because they canceled the KSI project in Toronto, there will be 200 social science PhDs who will not have a PhD dissertation project anymore, but there will be 200 dissertations on why it failed now. So <laughs> don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, I, I remember that from my own PhD was that I, the project that I was supposed to study collapsed like one year into my <laughs> PhD and I had to figure out like something new. But uh, yeah, I would like to say thank you to all of you who joined and to the speakers and the commentators. I think it was really great to hear from your experiences and your research. And uh, just want to say that um, this was our first time. So I apologize for any technical difficulties or other little glitches like and so on. But uh, we will organize new science talks over the fall. And we don't have the program completely ready, but we will let you know uh, and send it out to everybody as soon as we, we start to have the next speakers on, on board. So thank you so much for joining. And uh, I'm looking forward for future collaboration and dialogue and all of this. Okay, thanks. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.